So, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming on a sunny day for uh, uh, the hard and boring work of editing. I think that everybody who has been involved in editing knows how arduous it is. But it can also be exciting because you can have uh, uh, big arguments and fights because you know you do it within closed walls. So we'll see uh, how it works today uh, since we're doing this in a, in a public format. And uh, I will explain a little bit what we're going to do this afternoon, uh, both in terms of the format and a little bit about the thematic. Uh, but maybe just to, 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 to uh, say a little bit, uh, to follow up on what Maria was saying, that, 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 and this has to do with the format, that the, or hopefully also the tone of the discussion that we'll have today and the way that what is no, normally known as papers will be presented by the various speakers is that we want to keep, to try, it's difficult with this kind of room and with this kind of stage to have a fairly informal conversation, uh, but that can also be quite uh, uh, critical because what we're doing here is uh, also the work that, that the writers, contributors normally not are involved in, which is the discussion of their work and uh, the discussion of their work before it's published. So normally you would commission the text and then uh, you would publish them after some sort of process. Here we're almost doing the opposite. We're, we're doing the discussion before we have the text. We don't have any text. We don't have any papers as such to present to you. We have ideas and concerns that might fit into the format of a text. So this is what we will we'll try to do uh, um, this afternoon. And it will consist of, of uh, two parts, as you can see in the program. Uh, and the first part will consist of three contributions uh, from these wonderful colleagues of mine. This is also the, the first one is the most incestuous, I think, of the panels. I'll get into why in a second. Um, but uh, uh, that will hopefully give us some, let's say, theoretical uh, ideas and also some practical notions on how to think of uh, the future survival of the organizational form that is the art institution in the broadest sense of those terms. So to try and discuss how could we institute otherwise uh, and what does it mean to institute. Uh, but from that uh, conversation, which will be consist of three presentations of roughly 20 minutes, uh, we'll then have a conversation here in the room. Uh, and after that, there will be a, sh a coffee break, as you can see. And then we'll have... Uh, uh, to follow up on this more theoretical discussion, we'll have two case studies comparing uh, the fate of institutional structures in Europe uh, after the strong division that I think we have in Europe now between North and South rather than East and West. So perhaps that will be something about the former South and the former North of Europe as much as the former West. Uh, and that will be a, 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 a conversation where Maria will join me together with Pukayu, who's here, who's one of the curators and organizers of the Athens Biennial. Uh, and from those two case studies, you can say, the Dutch situation with Bach and then the Greek situation with Athens, uh, exemplified by the Athens Biennial, uh, will hopefully, uh, it will hopefully there be possible to, to use some of the terms that we come up with this afternoon in a reframing of that predicament that I think we all find ourselves in working with culture at the moment and with education as well. So um, the three speakers, and they're actually nicely seated in the, in the sequence in which you will speak, so that's very well done. So I'll move from the right to the left, which is always a good thing. Uh, always a good thing to move in that direction, not the other one. <laughs> well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on the far right here. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, um, the reason why I said it was slightly incestuous is that we have invited three researchers uh, from the same university, uh, but I would have to say they're from different departments, so it's maybe not too bad. <laughs> uh, and some of these departments are known for their, let's say, competition. Um, but uh, basically, we asked them because they have already uh, started a conversation slash research project, not in any kind of official sense, but a kind of shared conversation around the notion of organization and how we can think of organization differently and how we can perhaps even reclaim some of the terms in management from a point of view of cultural production rather than vice versa. Uh, so, um, to the left of me, 
right of you. We have first Andrea Phillips, then Mao Malono, and then finally Mark Fisher, who will speak. And I will give the mic to you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be part of this conversation. I think it's extraordinarily important. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit... Um, I'm going to now qualify what I'm going to talk about. So the first thing to say is that whilst um, I'm involved in uh, a number of conversations with all sorts of people in lots of different places in the world, I think from the perspective I'm going to talk from today, the beginning, is, is primarily British and potentially um, Anglo-Saxon, we could say. Um, because I think that um, in Britain we have produced the kind of the, the mother of all um, uh, the mother of all models for the privatization of art um, and I think it is it is a, a it is a structure um, in which arts institutions are deeply imbricated in uh, partnership relationships between public and private money that absolutely shapes and affects the way in which exhibition culture is produced this is a model that has grown um, uh, uh, it, it, with a huge velocity over the past 20 years. Um, but of course is, is part of a, a liberal and neoliberal structure that is deeply ingrained within uh, the kind of psychosocial political space of um, English and UK culture. So forgive me for talking from this perspective. Um, I think that other perspectives that um, are talked about later on will, will very much contradict these things, or I, I hope they will contradict it, let me put it that way. Um, but uh, I think the importance of recognizing this particular model is that um, we know, and we, and I, I'm guessing people here are artists and cultural workers in different fields who have um, various relationships with cultural organizations, including working and directing them, working in them and directing them. Um, we know that this model is, um, is, is a model that is extremely, um, uh, extremely popular with other governments. Okay? So it's a model that is regularly taken up in other places, uh, not only in other European places, and we, this might, we might come to this when uh, Maria talks later on about the situation in the Netherlands, where there's been a kind of um, uh, an incremental take-up of, the, of these models, and um, this is, as I know, still ongoing. I was talking with Sana from Casco earlier on today about this. Um, but um, it's also been taken up um, through the art market and through the development of infrastructures of um, capitalised artistic institutions um, uh, in you know, what are normally known as the BRICS and the MINTS countries. So, so this is a model that is being um, governmentalised uh, globally. Um, it's, a, it's a form of artistic colonialism, curatorial colonialism, uh, driven through the art market, and it is funded primarily through the relationship between the private infrastructures um, that are dominant um, in patronage forms across the globe and the, the small amounts of public funding that are still nominally attached to those institutions. We call the Tate Inc. a public institution, but of course it is now 85% privately funded. So I'm talking about that kind of culture. Okay, so that's the, the first qualification. The second one is obviously not a qualification, but to take up um, Maria's uh, kind of um, question in her introduction about um, the possibility of deprivatization. So what I want to just consider for 10 minutes is the idea of a deprivatized institution that is managed differently. And I, I just like to say that the aesthetic arrangement of this, uh, this meeting today with these, these kind of calls to thinking managerially <laughs> is great. <laughs> It's kind of something about the 1970s and managerial institutions <laughs> in the aesthetics here that I'm enjoying. Okay, so uh, so deprivatization. Um, so uh, so how can we make institutions public again? Yeah, I mean, how how could we do that? What are the steps through which we might need to go to make an institution public? How how can we uh, remember? de-incorporate ourselves from the idea of the public institution that is currently dominate within Anglo-Saxon constitutions. Um, 
uh, Mark, Mao and I came together in a, in a, in a workshop that we organised in September last year um, that tried to think about organisation. And we were really doing this um, with uh, and through the curatorial, um, uh, the curating MFA at Goldsmiths. So we're trying to think about this with young curators, uh, uh, people looking at uh, pra doing practice-based research in art and curating at Goldsmiths. So we were trying to think this through with people that are um, both um, hoping to develop institutional formats when they leave their education, if they ever do, and, um, and also kind of thinking very critically about the political formats of our institutions. So this was the kind of, this was the, the context in which we originally um, started to develop these ideas. Um, what I'm going to do is read a little bit and then, and, then, um, and then come back to some kind of pragmatic questions that relate to a number of uh, projects I'm involved in at the moment. So first of all, I'm just going to read in a way to, to typify the problem. Um, but in a way, what I'm going to read reflects mimics, parrots, lots of the research that's gone on in Former West in its previous iterations. So just to kind of recap in a sense. Former West, I think, is, is, is very influential in this regard. I want to make it more influential, if you will. So, so to ask the question, um, how can we recover the public function, which is both subjective and governmental within arts institutions and the workers within them? What is our admi administrative and managerial ethos and how should it or could it be changed? What is the ethos of management within the institutions? To put it very simply, when um, curators, directors, um, visiting researchers are involved in um, commissioning content for an institution, an exhibition, a series of events, and that content and that, um, that event might propose or produce a form of, dis of or a call to or an illustration of a radically left conceptualization of the way that the world should be run, how does that claim in the content of the work manage the back of the institution? Often people, I learned this from um, talking to my colleagues in critical management studies, this kind of field of research that is, I'm beginning to look into to, to help me understand this. How do the front and the back of the institution operate together? What I would say is in the Anglo-Saxon model, the front and the back of the institution don't meet at all. So the front of the institution might propose some kind of ra radical repurposing of um, ideological narratives, and the back of the institution will be running on um, unequal pay structures, on free internships, where uh, young assistant curators have no freedom of speech to intervene within the narrative of the institution, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so how, how can we imagine an institution where those two sides, the front and the back, meet somewhere? In this way, art institutions um, uh, need to understand themselves not simply as exemplifying new ideas about social and political organisation in the content of their exhibitions and events, but also demonstrate how an organisation can be fairly run. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that arts, institu arts institutions, and I think that in a way this is, I think, what I understand back to be trying to do, um, need to begin not simply to exemplify new ideas or actually old ideas in the content of the exhibition, but they need to do it as exemplifications of ways of working in the world. Okay, so exemplifications that mean that uh, those people that work within institutions and those people that collaborate with them, i.e. me, need to stop, stop engaging with uh, the kind of potentially kind of, not stop engaging, but uh, move towards engaging with uh, managerial and administrative structures and thinking through the ways in which they um, imbricate certain politics within the ways that we work together, the way we talk together, the way that we communicate. So, reading. How can arts institutions avoid the capture of capitalization? Why does this seem so unimaginable? The transformation of cultural provision from a largely cheap or free, basically funded and low-key activity to one that is corporately funded within a fluid network of public and private patronage initiatives that has high media profile but is out of bounds both culturally and financially to most people is one of the achievements of processes of neoliberalization 
as its mechanisms have continued to be adopted and perfected in Anglo-Saxon, perhaps we can say Anglo-European governments over the past 30 years. Key to this transformation are a number of procedures that have been embraced by the arts. The adoption of a market economy as the basis for cultural transaction, the instantiation of competition and meritocracy as the methods which delineate what gets shown and where it gets shown, and the naturalization of private patronage and its taste-shaping capacities. This basic imbrication of the market economy into government, which includes cultural provision, is, as we know, Foucault tells us, the neoliberal art of government. It is within arts provision, I would say, at different scales and temporalities, some obvious, like Tate, some less obvious, smaller institutions, institutions that are seen as very left field. It is within these arts institutions that a discrete and almost perfect example of such transformation can usually be found at all scales and at all levels. Importantly, this transformation is not only organizational, but also subjective. We know this also from Foucault and various other people. It is in the enmeshing of the managerial governmental and the subjective that the arts are able to present an avant-garde for such procedures in the ways that artists are trained up and managed and put on display by arts institutional systems. Display effectively maintains a particular type of division of labor that in, 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 uh, in um, perpetuity also maintains a market relation. Um, this is at once nationally specific and global. I've talked about the bricks and the mints. Um, in discussions with the directors, curators, and educationalists I work with on a regular basis, it becomes clear that in order to maintain spaces of cultural production, insistent upon exhibition and event making as contingent, politicized, and non-elite forms, but also wants to maintain those in relationship to an equal and fairly organized and managed uh, organization, one has to become conversant with both the languages of struggle and the languages of capitalism in order to survive. We might call this a kind of normative understanding of survivalism, to kind of pick the, 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 the language, the term that is key here today. Conditions differ, differ between territories and patterns of funding and support for local experimental practices contrast considerably, of course, from city to city, from state to state. But rather than what we understand historically as critique, and again, this has been covered by um, previous editions of Former West, I'm interested in this, in what I'm interested in is the managerial and organizational change that embeds political equality within an institution itself. This, necessitate, this necessitates, excuse me, a more humble and administrative turn approach in which the aesthetic is placed on lateral terms with the more mundane opening up of facilities and capacities. For example, the negotiation of equality of pay, of freedom of speech, of market transparency within the institution's workforce itself and towards its public. This is not a call for what I understand as um, instituting in common in a way, or maybe it is. I'm not quite sure what I understand as institution in common, so maybe we can come back to that. But rather a realization that for arts organizations in particular, the act of maintaining a space through which the conditions of neoliberalism must pass and be transformed is the primary function. This is an act for management, for attendance to the arts administration in real terms. So, so I think what I'm saying is that um, many of the institutions I work with um, that are very different scales um, understand that they need to be conversant with the typologies and structures of neoliberalism in order to survive. And that's what I will call on the one hand what I'm calling normative survivalism. It's a bit of a contradiction. And on the other hand, their ambition is to work in a different way. So my question really is, how can arts institutions work through processes of neoliberalism to achieve more public formats in which they become exemplifications of different ways of working? And I'm not just talking about exemplification, exemplifications of different ways of working within the context of the arts, 
because I see this, and uh, Paul Gilroy has written very brilliantly about um, the way in which neoliberalism um, is, 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 is absolutely redolent within all institutions, so not just educational and not just artistic, but you know, within all institutions, within all civic institutions. How we might um, work through the process of neoliberalism, the capture of um, the kind of colonial capture of our lives and our work in order to achieve something else, in order to transform institutions like BAG or like the Tate, let's imagine, into places where alternative forms of organizing democratic structures within our environments, our towns, our cities, our nations, might be proposed. What I'm suggesting is a kind of managerial repurposing of the arts institution as a form of um, uh, of very publicly uh, proposing an alternative to capitalization. So I'll leave it there. That's the kind of very basic thing. Um, that, just to say one a kind of um, footnote, I guess, is that these, these questions I've been, I, the, the reason I'm asking these questions is, you know, of course, partly um, through, through working at Goldsmiths, but it's also very influenced by working um, at the moment with three different networks. One is the cluster network. Um, in fact, the text I wrote, um, I, I read out as a part of a text that I've just written for them, which is a network of, Sana, is it, would you, uh, they're called um, periphery organizations? I don't. Small scale art, art organizations located in the periphery of larger European cities. Right, so that's the cluster groups. There's a very specific kind of di Venn diagram. Small scale organizations located on the periphery of Large scale. Large scale. <laughs> blah. Okay, so that's one group. But there's a group of people, it's effectively a group of organizations coming together to discuss uh, questions of survival and questions of support structure. Secondly, and a slightly more, um, uh, slightly less transparently, I would guess, would be an organization called Common Practice, which is a, a group of institutions that are also looking for ways to fund themselves. I would say it's a more neoliberal project. And the third one is, is a, um, an organization or a set of um, institutions that have come together to do a three-year project called How to Work Together, which is funded by the Arts Council of England to develop entrepreneurial skills. So I'm talking to them about how the, develop, the, 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 the demand to develop entrepreneurial skills might be re-understood as a way to develop new ideas of working together. But all of these things involve, uh, you know, talking about how, who, who empties the bins and who cleans the toilet. Okay, I'll leave it there for now. Um, yes, uh, some of my issue would be uh, connected to what Andrea talks about, actually. Um, uh, when I was thinking about survivalism at the beginning, I was kind of um, worried because uh, the notion of survival is uh, really implicit in the way capitalism operates and in the way capitalism defines itself uh, since, you know, the kind of early assumption of uh, competition and, uh, and uh, this idea of scarcity. And so I thought that maybe as an anthropologist, I was, uh, uh, you know, kind of invited to uh, support the kind of uh, uh, assumption in a way that anthropologist uh, as a science has been split between this kind of uh, anarcho-primitivism and uh, this, kind of, this kind of Victorian soul, this Victorian uh, positivist uh, uh, way of operating. Um, especially today, anthropologists and, and uh, uh, you know, the notion of the common, the notion of commoning, uh, has come out from a series of collaboration and, and uh, uh, contribution by anthropologists. In a way, I want to uh, try as an anthropology and political, political economist to contribute to, to resurrect this notion of the common, but after a long trajectory of criticism, especially in the way uh, some art discourse have been using the notion of the common. And last year had been a good year for uh, this discussion about self-organization. There were at least three publications about self-organization and common and commoning which I found really interesting. One is called The Artist Run Spaces, and the, the other one is Self-Organization. Then there was another really interesting reader on uh, Work, Work, Work. All these are very inspiring publications, and in a way they kind of uh, really, uh, I engage with them um, to rethink uh, about common and positive way of looking at the common today. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, occurred to me is, uh, especially uh, starting from uh, Dilemuth, uh, Jacobsen, and Davis, uh, 
discussion of self-organization. Um, it seems to me that uh, there is a strong uh, uh, sort of emphasis on the notion of self-organization, uh, which in a way reproduce uh, all the uh, sort of notion of uh, uh, primitivism or anarcho-primitivism or uh, sort of, uh, um, uh, I would say, return to the subsistence economy. As we know, these were very important uh, uh, discourses, especially in the shape of ecofeminism in the 1970s, uh, which made a very important contribution. Uh, but I think these are, uh, today we are in a different situation in which these uh, uh, sort of old debates have to take uh, uh, sort of stepped up a little bit in terms of the uh, um, sort of possible pragmatic uh, applicability. So one of the things that I think uh, is problematic about this approach is a series of assumptions uh, which, uh, in a way, really come back from the kind of uh, tradition of modernism, of modernist anthropology. One is, for instance, that small is better than big, is more democratic than big, mm -hmm. that horizontal is better than vertical. Uh, the idea, for instance, that the market and the social can be two different things, whereas the market is really reproductive, you know, is an invention of the social. Um, as well, in the 1970s, there was this idea of, uh, of uh, the art institution as going back to the skill of the artisan. So there was a very, really big emphasis against, uh, you know, the kind of mechanization of labor, uh, a withdrawal for consumption, mass production. So in a way, in the 1970s, this was all a, 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 a kind of very much a way of uh, uh, withdrawing from, uh, uh, from, from society, from withdrawing from, from, from capitalism. And um, it seems to me that today uh, uh, the same uh, discourse has been kind of reproduced in the context of uh, post-Fordism. So if in the past uh, the enemy was mass production, today the enemy is finance, is uh, 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 this idea of uh, uh, you know the kind of general intellect, which has uh, gone out of the factory and, and uh, colonized every aspect of life? Uh, the problem is circulation and not production. So there is a series of uh, 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 the same discourse has been kind of reframed in the context of uh, 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 today's uh, uh, sort of financial economy or post-Fordist uh, context, which um, uh, in a way it's. Um, Problematic, and I will uh, I will I will say why it's problematic a little bit later. Uh, but it is very important to uh, 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 emphasize that, of course, uh, a lot of uh, exhibition, uh, the exhibition, for instance, on the precariat or the exhibition that Macba did uh, on uh, inf uh, informal labor uh, or precarious labor, uh, were very important. But still, at some kind of uh, specific focus, which uh, uh, didn't take in consideration the broader uh, political economy, the, bro the broader global context, especially this, the historical and geographical specificity of, uh, of capitalism and how capitalism impacts on art institutions. So, um, and the third, I guess, uh, issue is uh, that um, I think the issue of institutions and the very process of institut institutionalization has been looked, uh, uh, in a way, uh, um, oscillating between the idea of the flow, between the idea, you know, it could be uh, exemplified by the conversation between Negri and Agamben. You know, Agamben says that basically there is no democracy without institution, and Negri says that the democracy is the flow. And so, in a way, this, this opposition between the flow and the institution has always been reproduced in these discourses. And in a way, anthropology, uh, especially Gregory Bateson was 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 kind of always uh, uh, reflecting on this problem of the of the institution. Was always reflecting whether humanity could exist without institution, if culture itself could exist without institution. Um, and so I think it is, it's interesting, uh, perhaps uh, uh, looking at quasi institution or, or process of institutionalization. Uh, um, and uh, I think uh, there are uh, many interesting contributions. For instance, Bang Larsen talks about the quasi institution or the idea of uh, walking on the outlines of institution. Uh, um, Montman talks about the institution that comes in uh, uh, post industrial, uh, post colonial context, that, uh, a mix of uh, art institution, research practices, and activism. But um, so. Basically, what I want to uh, uh, I want to now go back to the notion of the common and try to understand uh, whether we can uh, think about the common and practice the common, not as a simple opposition 
uh, to the state or to the market, but uh, is really a, 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 a strategy uh, uh, which in a way defies this kind of uh, uh, objectification or fetishization of, of, uh, of, of capital institution. And I think that Catherine Gibson, the work of Catherine Gibson of post-capitalism post is very important here because what she's saying is precisely that uh, uh, capitalism does not exist in a pure form. It's always embedded in forms of communism, in form of, of, of uh, state uh, uh, control. And, and I think as I, I, in my work of anthropologist, uh, I've always looked at this kind of uh, fusion between different uh, modes of production and the transversality of modes of production in real life. Um, uh, so one of the things that I think is very uh, uh, important is to, is to try to get out from an ethnocentric understanding of, uh, of economic institution, of political economy, of organization, and uh, incorporate somehow uh, the experience that uh, are elaborated and, 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 and instituted in the peripheries. And, and, and bearing in mind the peripheries are obviously ever shifting. Uh, for instance, the cooperativism in Latin America in the 1970s and 80s were very strong, was, you know, they were very powerful in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in challenging, in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, destroying uh, dictatorship, and the art collective that came out from that context in a way were kind of the early uh, 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 kind of institution of the common, because they were came out from the context where the public, the state, the market, really did, did not exist as such, or they, not, they, they did not exist in the kind of fetishized uh, uh, kind of uh, form. So one of the interesting things is to try to look at these experiences uh, in the way they are emerging today. And I think that, that, that talking about, for instance, Greece, Italy, Spain, as well as uh, uh, you know, the emerging peripheries in, 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 in also Northern Europe is a very good uh, uh, point. And I will briefly discuss my experience in, in Italy with the Teatro Valle and uh, with Officine Zero, but also uh, in France, uh, a, a workers' factory uh, in Marseille, which is uh, uh, creating an interesting connection with um, uh, a transversal connection between art organization and, and occupied factories. One of the things that I wanted to do is to, 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 to try to get out from, from this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, framework uh, that it's, it's uh, a little bit objectifying framework. It's important to, to uh, remember that post-Fordism is really a condition of, uh, of, uh, of the North, a condition of, uh, of, uh, of Western uh, uh, countries. Uh, uh, and that you know many many uh, uh, places in the world are really ruled by a kind of dystopic combination of Taylorism, of uh, you know high tech hubs, uh, informal economies, uh, slums. So the, 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 you know we, in order to refine our political tools, we also have to look at this kind of uh, diversities, uh, especially in the peripheries. And the second thing that I found interesting is um, uh, this uh, notion of um, of um, uh, this return, in a way, of uh, the common it seems to me that it's inspired by a certain sense of religiosity mm -hmm. and uh, spirituality, which uh, we need to assess. Uh, I was really uh, super inspired by the exhibition at Casco, and I felt suddenly that I was in, in, a, in, a, in a space where I could be safe, and, uh, and, uh, and I, I loved it. Um, and I think it's really interesting this connection also with the heresies of the 14th century, for instance, mm -hmm. which were really revolutionary moments uh, uh, historically. But on the other hand, there is also a return to the kind of uh, Schumacher, you know, Buddhist economy. You know, the all ecologist movement came out from this kind of smallest beautiful movements that came out in the 1970s as a kind of reflection of the old crisis in, in Britain. Schumacher wrote this book. He was an advisor for, in the uh, National Coal Board. And, uh, and uh, he was an advisor of Keynes. So there is a really interesting connection between this kind of capitalist crisis and uh, this kind of uh, 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 a series of Buddhist or, 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 or spiritual economies that come out uh, uh, from the crisis, which is fine, and, but, but you know, it could end up in some kind of uh, uh, another kind of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the last, uh, I, I'm kind of taking lots of, uh, uh, time in, 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 in my introduction, uh, but I've already finished. Uh, my, but I want to talk also very quickly about the, the notion of common and a few ideas. Uh, commons as cutting across different modes of production, the idea that common can exist uh, in different spaces. 
Uh, common does not exist naturally, but has to be produced. Uh, uh, David Harvey talked about commoning. Uh, Gerard Browning talked about instituting the common. Commons are re relational. As we know, uh, commons is also based on structural exclusion. So it relies on also uh, on uh, setting rules for other people not to uh, use resources. And that's a kind of paradox of common. Uh, which uh, uh, we have to think about it as well. It, it makes me think about the esposito relationship between communitas and immunitas. So every community has to set some kind of mechanism of exclusion. And do we want that and how we, we set that up? Um, and finally, I guess uh, uh, the, the experience of the common that I've been uh, uh, following closely um, are, have been experience of crisis, experience of reaction to uh, privatization to a uh, threat of closure and um, and it's very painful to see how these experiences uh, happen already uh, when when it's late when it's too late and um, I was especially uh, discussing with an occupy factory in Marseille it was a tea factory that was uh, uh, owned by the Unilever and then uh, uh, the workers uh, occupied it and um, and in a way the trade union don't understand that this occupation it's, it can be very inspiring for all the other factories that, that, in a way, are not yet in a state of crisis. But they don't know, because obviously the decision to close down the factory happens five years, ten years before they're already closed down. Mm -hmm. So, and, and likewise with the Teatro Valle and with other experience. Um, so the point is, uh, uh, can commons be instituted not in times of crisis? Um, and the second point is uh, uh, this idea of transversality of the common. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, this is something I'm very uh, involved recently, uh, how you get connection between uh, 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 factories, workers' movement, artists' uh, uh, collective, uh, intellectuals. This is something that is very, very important and in a way connects with a, a broader issue of, uh, of um, activism that we are looking, we are kind of experiencing today. Uh, probably we'll talk more about that later, but what kind of activism, uh, uh, the, the, uh, what kind of class reading can we give uh, of uh, the activism is, uh, that are happening in these new periphery, peripheries? Uh, people talk about middle class activism, uh, but I think it's a new composition. It's, there is a new class composition that is happening and that we need to look at to really understand how a, a kind of proactive way of, uh, mode of commoning can be instituted. And I leave it here. Thanks. Um, okay, well, I'm going to take up some threads from Mel and, um, and Andrea, and to, but take a sort of broader perspective, I think, on the, the problems of the left, uh, particularly since 2008, uh, in which this institutional, in which we can, as a means of contextualizing this um, institutional crisis. Um, I mean, uh, the, the sort of big problem, of course, is why the left has failed to make much significant ground since 2008 at a major moment of capitalist crisis. Um, and I think in order to answer that, we'd have to uh, reflect on you know, some of the dominant philosophies, uh, strategies of the left um, you know, since at least the, the 90s, but per perhaps going back to, to, to uh, 68 and the whole post-68 moment. I think it's time to you know, revise some of the uh, things that we've, you know, those of us coming from that generation have taken for granted. Um, I mean, so, I mean, uh, so the, I think the overall rubric for what we're going to say will go under the heading of management versus managerialism, of thinking, uh, of thinking through the opposition. Because um, I think, you know, part of what, what is neoliberalism, um, one dimension of it has been the imposition of, of managerialism, um, which isn't the same as uh, the imposition of effective management. Um, I think you know those of us who work in the liberal institutions, which is almost all of us, unless you're very fortunate, will, will know that um, neoliberalism does not co correspond to what, you know good management. It does not correspond to increased productivity or increased e efficiency. And I think this thing about the back and the front end actually. Uh, also goes for neoliberalism itself, the front end of neoliberalism, what it likes to present itself as, um, 
and the back end of neoliberalism, what, actually, what it actually does, don't fit together. But that contradiction isn't a problem for neoliberalism. It has been the very basis of its success in lots of ways. Mm. And, and specifically, you know, what the front end is more freedom, more autonomy. Um, the back end is um, more control, uh, more bureau bureaucratic micromanagement, um, more kind of chaos, um, lowering of productivity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, as I say, I think that, uh, that the, the fact that that contradiction is there uh, is, is, what, is what neoliberalism has run on. It's the basis of its success. Um, it, it won't itself cause neoliberalism to collapse, pointing out that contradiction, actually. <laughs> um, I, mean, so, I mean, what I mean by managerialism, then, is this, um, you know, uh, partly the, the imposition of new languages that, that Andrew was talking about. I mean, this is, this, this is ideology in a classic Althusserian sense, um, something which, in retrospect, we probably didn't take seriously enough. Uh, was you know the, uh, the, the 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 requirement that we start to use languages based on business, that we start to institute um, practices based on uh, coming out of business, um, that you know this question of religion on a practical level, you know um, the ne Neil and you will believe as Althusser says of ideology, um, we you know we thought we could mouth these business platitudes without uh, without absorbing the the ideas of business, it doesn't really work like that. Once, you know, once you're required to um, talk, genuflect, uh, speak, in, um, and act in terms of um, this, you know, business, then th you know, that becomes a, a, a dominant way of thinking and behaving, evidently. Um, so, the, you know, on the, the, the imposition of new languages alongside the imposition of new structures, which, which you know, Andrew talked about in terms of you know, um, privatisation. Um, But you know, I think that uh, then I think specifically in relation to this question of um, conditions for cultural production, uh, I think it's increasingly been evident to me uh, in, in my work that the uh, the distinction between the conditions for cultural production and uh, the possibilities of cultural production itself. Um, why do I say that now? Why do I mention this? Well, because I think there's a um, rhetorical anti-institutionalism in neoliberalism, which wants to downplay the importance of institutions uh, in uh, fostering cultural production. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I think the, there's a metaphysics of, of neoliberalism, which is that creativity is equally distributed, it's just unequally kind of blocked, you might say. And what is it that blocks it? Uh, what is it that blocks creativity according to neoliberalism? Well, you know, it's institutions, it's the state. Um, so, the, the, you know, the metaphysics here is the more that we remove the state, the more that we remove these kind of institutional blockages, the more that creativity will flourish. Mm. And, you know, in terms of what, you know, Andrew is talking about with the, um, the, the avant-garde of, of, of neoliberalism in the UK, this was, you know, this is a big part of the claim there. This is a big, this is a big part of the, the philosophical um, uh, kind of arm, um, weaponry of, of, of neoliberalism in, in the UK was this idea that if you roll back the state, if you, um, uh, if you, you know, curtail institutions, if you don't fund them, then that will liberate this creative energy that is otherwise being um, suppressed, held back, um, detained by um, a kind of state bureaucracy, really. Um, but I guess the, the, problem, uh, the problem, though, is the, is the way, for, for me, is the way in which certain uh, thinking on the left, uh, particularly in anti-capitalism, if I can speak a bit schematically and crudely, you know, has, has, has echoed, has echoed this, these kind of perceptions, really. Um, what I've called um, neo-anarchism, uh, I, th I think, is one of the down dominant um, trajectories in, in, in the left, particularly since the 90s, um, you know, has really, uh, in a not even an inverted form, and it, you know, it pretty much echoes that those priorities, really. Anti-statism, anti-institutionalism, um, anti-kind anti of management and, and, and organisation um, have become the kind of uh, 
you know, key doctrines of this, uh, of, of this neo-anarchism. Um, but the problem is that there's a kind of ingenuousness on the left, which there isn't on the right. The right, um, the, the right is prepared to spout all this stuff about um, anti-statism, anti-institutionalism, but it makes damn sure that it controls institutions and the state. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's one of the ways in which it has, has kind of suckered us, actually. That, uh, you know, we, say, we, take, you know, we take very seriously and very earnest about being uh, anti-the state, withdrawing from the state. The state is essentially corrupt, we're not going to have any part of it. Um, the, the right says, thank you very much, okay, we'll run the state then. Whilst, whilst, whilst also, that's what, that's what I mean about this, this form of contradiction or disavowal of, that's uh, built into neoliberalism is not a problem for it at all. It's a problem for us, actually, um, if we take it too seriously. Um, and so, you know, I think coming back to this issue of withdrawal that you, that you raise, it's, it's been pretty clear that we, the strategy has, has not worked. The strategy of, of, kind of, kind of withdrawing from capital, of trying to op operate entirely outside the state or institutions, uh, has not worked, um, shows no prospect of working, uh, and, you know, uh, it, but that's kind of at the level of the, the empirical about what's actually happened. But also, the, the, at the more a priori level, it concedes the ground of the state, uh, of institutions, and more broadly, of mainstream culture to, to the right. It'll, uh, you know, the, even the goal of, to, of withdrawal itself, which I don't think we, we can, particularly in conditions of, of, of post fordism of kind of communicative capitalism, withdrawal is very, very difficult. And perhaps uh, the term withdrawal uh, is also interesting in light of its uh, connections with addiction. Um, yeah. If you see everyone, see everyone in there with a, um, uh, sitting at the table with their laptops, uh, immediately wanting to plug in as soon as there was a possibility of a Wi-Fi connection. I mean, um, you know, we all know that. We all know that sense of compulsive, that the compulsion to connect, um, which, uh, you know, which it's partly about, um, partly about pleasure, um, but also partly about work and, and the fusion of the two. Um, but, you know, that we don't, we don't, we know, the point is that we don't want to withdraw, actually. That's part, that's, that's part of the issue. Not only do we... Um, can't, we can't withdraw, we don't want to withdraw, uh, we, want, we want to stay plugged in. Um, so it seems to me then the question is about um, if we want to stay plugged in, both kind of metaphorically and literally, uh, if we want to be um, inside these institutions running them, um, rather than outside of them running against them, you know, what, what will be involved in that? Um, I think this is in a way the question we're all posing from different angles. I mean, the first thing to say is that you d d d when one is inside an institution doesn't mean one's completely inside it. Uh, and that it seems to me that the, 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 well, the, the thing that's hanging behind everything I've said, I guess, is the problem of hegemony, hegemony. I never know which way you're supposed to say it. Um, but the, the, I mean, I think this is, uh, you know, come back to that question I first posed, about why the left has made so little ground since 2008, is this question of hegemony, that the, that the right still has hegemonic control of you know, the, 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 the major narratives, uh, the major frames uh, of, uh, in which we, life and work are embedded. And that hegemony cannot be overcome by, uh, via withdrawal. Withdrawal, you could say, is an anti-hegemonic strategy anyway. You know, it's it's saying well, would, it's and to me, um, I think a lot of a lot of these strategies, a lot of these uh, doctrines, uh, have really turned sort of defeat into consolation or defeat into uh, the, the, the trying to uh, posit positivize a situation of defeat ultimately. Um, This, and I think this comes back to this issue of 68, the legacy of 68. Um, you know, this legacy of undoing, of unlearning, of, of marginality, of, of radicality. Um, and which has been the kind of background noise, you know, whilst this has been generated out of culture and out of a left identifying culture, uh, you know, capital has continued its... Uh, increasing stranglehold over um, culture, the psyche, um, and the economy. Um, 
it's you know that, but, but that is not just uh, that, and I think that's the, 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 the point I think that's in some ways inevitable um, it's not just about these things being defeated it's almost about them, them succeeding too well in a certain way because you know if if the idea is um, permanent opposition um, if the idea is a kind of um, yeah, mandatory oppositionalism, then of course we won't, we won't be running things. The other side will be running things. Um, and you know, if we're in states of, uh, where, of doubt, uh, of indeterminacy, um, these, these might have aesthetic sort of uh, benefits, virtues, um, but strategically speaking, they, they weaken us. Um, you know, the, the, again, the contrast with the right couldn't be more salutary. The right uh, knows what it knows what it wants to do, has no doubt about it, and you know it carries on doing it. And that's something we we see in, we, we see in the uh, in the UK um, very dramatically, and particularly since the, um, the, the the new coalition government came in. Um, you know, we thought things couldn't get any worse uh, than under New Labour. We soon proved wrong. With the, with the coalition government, that you know, that, that those small, the, the remaining spaces of, 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 uh, of the relics of, of, of social democracy, uh, they, they've kind of systematically rooting them out and, and destroying them. Really. Um, but that, you know, that's part of the issue. That they, as soon as they come in, they they act very decisively. Um, you know, with this, you know, this post '68 ethic, aesthetic of uh, of indeterminacy, doubt, etc. It doesn't really make for um, uh, it doesn't really lend itself to acting decisively. On the contrary, really, um, and you know that might that can make us easy prey for the for, for, for the right. To. Um, so you know, so what I'm suggesting then is uh, you know a, 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 a return to the to the old leftist ambition. I mean, it's, it's, I think we, we can measure the scale of kind of leftist uh, defeat by uh, by this uh, by remembering, you know, what the left once thought it could do. The left once thought it could control uh, and manage society, and it could control and manage society much better than capitalism. Um, great example of this: Francis Buffett's book, um, Red Plenty. If people have read that. Um, which is about this period, post-Stalinist period, when the, uh, the Soviet economy was the, the, the fastest growing economy in the world. It's about this brief period when there was you know, high Soviet confidence. Uh, and, but part of the rhetoric there was, you know, it was, it was all about, we can run things better. Capitalism is chaotic, it's disordered, um, it pro you know, produces lots of stuff that people that, that obviously like, but uh, in, in this chaotic and disordered way. What what um, what communism could provide would be a you know a, more, a better managed society, um, and you know that uh, you know the scale of that ambition and the reduction of that um, the reduction from that an, uh, ambition to, to run everything to run it better um, to have really the first uh, properly managed society in human history from that to you know. Uh, <sighs> A kind of protest model, uh, I think, is uh, gives us a sense of of, of, of of the scale of defeat or, or, the, or, the, or the lowering of uh, ambitions and expectations under neoliberalism. Um, and it, and I think partly what is was another effect of this uh, of these discourses for people working in institutions uh, on on the left is typically subjectively a feeling of kind of self-loathing. Of, of being divided against yourself, um, that you know, if institutions are really bad, um, if if the state is inherently bad, you know, if you're working for an, a, a, a state institution, or um, then, you know, uh, you're you're inevitably kind of corrupted or compromised. Um, again, I, I think this uh, this this is obviously this uh, weakens us actually, um, and so instead of that form of um, Self-loathing, which uh, you know is how things really work. That um, the, 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 they're quite the, the right's quite happy with us to, to, to loathe ourselves. To, you know that 
it makes us, it makes it easier for the, for them to, to run things. Um, the, just as the quiet people to doubt ourselves, the quiet people to to to, to, to loathe ourselves. As well. um, so inst- instead of that, you know, an embrace of the t- t- terrain that we're actually on. Um, you know, talked about um, you talked about Negri earlier, but the you know the, the, a lot of the success of Negri is, is really down to the, the very institutionals that he and something disdains. So, I mean, what is it that circulates Negri's thought if not uh, if not institutions largely? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, rather you know, rather than um, being anxious about that, worrying about it, thinking it's some kind of hypocrisy, I think is to actually embrace the situation of uh, in which. You know, quite clearly that you know the, the space for the left is the, the space for the left is, is, is institutions, um, especially our institutions. That's you know that that's where uh, new ideas on the left um, get circulated. Um, let you know. Let's uh, be be positive about that, um, but also you know recognise that that means uh, you know as, as Andrew said we need to not be complacent about the current state of it, who could be complacent about it, but um, you know, to, to work to, to change the, 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 the back end of the institutions, as Andrea said, but also it's a problem of articulation. This is what hegemony is about. That you know, the right, right-wing hegemony is not only about uh, the economy, it's not only about media, um, it was about being able to put together a um, patchwork of, uh, of Different sort of hubs that that would that resonate together. Mm. You know that is that's the. That, I mean this is this is I think part of the you know mm. coming back to Negri and I mean, Negri, rege- well Hart and Negri and the Commonwealth reject the idea of hegemony because they say it requires unity. Well hegemony doesn't require unity at all. It, it re- you know it requires some kind of coordination, um, and we you know which the right has has achieved. Um, so this you know brings us back to this, this question of articulation. Of, uh, of heterogeneous assemblages, um, of uh, you know, in the, the sort of old slogan of British cultural studies of being within and against institutions, really, rather not rather than just uh, either inside them or outside on the street. And just finally, I think this means a broader question about taking struggle back into the workplace. Mm. I mean, um, that's you know, typically. What we've seen since the you know since the 90s, especially, um, is uh, the key sites of uh, of, of struggle of, of these sort of leading edge movements um, from the anti-capitalism of the 90s, early 2000s up to Occupy has been outside workplaces, um, and uh, you know that, that perhaps the simplest explanation for the, the, the rise of neoliberalism in a country like the UK. Uh, is the decline of trade unions, you could say. I mean, what is that trade unions do that something like Occupy uh, has not done? Um, what well, is that they directly politicize the workplace? They open up this question of you know, worker control, of, uh, of, of actual autonomy, as opposed to the promised autonomy of, of neoliberalism, you know, questions of workplace democracy, etc. Now, it's not to say that um, trade unions are some ideal form um, which, uh, which we can just return to. But what I would, what I would say is that, um, you know, nothing, quite clearly nothing has replaced what trade unions once did. Um, and, you know, in terms of this uh, positing the workplace as a terrain of struggle. And, you know, that, and I guess that's the, 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 the overall thing that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to suggest. Uh, is um, rather than withdrawing from things, it is um, rediscovering them as terrains of struggle. Uh, you know, rather than accepting mean, the problem with, with part of the problem with withdrawal, I think, is it it's, uh, is it concedes not only concedes the, the space, but it, it it takes it out of struggle. It says, okay, this is this is something that uh, we can't win. Um, I think it's crucial that we. Um, we see everything is up for grabs, um, and that uh, you know that everything is up for grabs, and that we find new ways of struggling for it. Okay, I'll end on that.
I was going to say, if you think, um, you think it's ironic, three academics talking about running arts organizations, you're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so forgive us. <laughs> yeah, so go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. I have questions for all three of you. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. I, this is what I understood when you were coming towards me with the mic in your hand. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. Um, I, great to see some Goldsmiths people here. <laughs> I, I was I, I was based there for 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 a while. But anyway, um, the uh, and I, th I think it's a it's a beautiful idea, you know, that that you know sort of we think of our arts institutions as sort of immediately political institutions, right? I mean, that 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 that, that don't just do aesthetics, but you know, sort of. Uh, the, the sort of the training grounds, as probably you know, slaughter I could probably call it, you know, of uh, of sort of new, uh, uh, you know, social, uh, even perhaps you know, economic, managerial anyway practice, right? I mean, yeah. that's what I what I what I understood. But but I mean, I, what I'm wondering, I mean, it's a beautiful, you know, vision. But there was a lot of you know, we should and we could in your in your in your in your talk, and and I, I just wonder who this we is. I mean, it's definitely yeah. not the Tate. I mean, why would the Tate? Do something like that. I mean, why would they even, you know, think of diverting from, you know, what they're doing uh, uh, right now? The um, uh, Massimiliano, I, I, I thought the idea of this, um, this, this sort of return of um, of the commons as something that is spiritual. I, I, I think you know, it's, it's totally, you know, um, on, you know, spot on because I think it was like two or three weeks ago that uh, Michel Balans uh, sent an open letter to the to the Pope. Um, Asking him, you, you know Michel Balance, right? He's this guy who he's the sort of the peer-to-peer -peer god, uh, right? Belgian of or origin, but residing in uh, in Thailand, and he he runs this peer-to-peer -peer foundation, very very uh, uh, influential around all things, uh, you know, concerned with the, the, the common. And so he wrote this open letter to the uh, to, to to the Pope, saying, you know, why why not you know use the the land and you know the Sort of buildings that, that the church owns to set up maker spaces and so on and so on and so on, which I thought was quite quite hilarious. So so you know there's even like a direct uh, a link there, and the and 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 what Mark said, I I mean I, I mean this is great. I, I I think the left probably has a, a very good a very good argument you know, for you know for, for saying you know, we we we're the better managers, right? I mean in 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 a way, right? I mean sort of this this this, this you know, dualism between you know management versus uh, uh, man managerialism, but 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 I mean, you're saying, you know, let's take over. I mean, ha hegemony in terms of takeover of institutions, and and you're saying, you know, particular art institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that was a slip, but I, mean, but I think that's totally wrong, you know, I, 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 I may, because at the moment, you know, probably the last refuge of the left is the mm -hmm. art institution, <laughs> and I think that that should quickly, quickly change. And and the, but that's I mean, uh, that was probably a slip or something. I I, I don't know. All right, that was it. Who, who, okay. Mark, you. No, not, no, not, I don't see why it was a slip, really. I mean, the, I mean we would certainly want to... I, I mean, I, I was saying that. I mean, I think that, was, as we were saying in, in the talk, that, 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 that you know, that our institutions, as, as they are, even under neoliberal control, you know, are, are spaces in which, you know, left ideas do circulate. Um... So yeah, I mean, we don't want that to, to to carry on, but I don't. Um, it doesn't mean that they're that they're in some ideal form as they are for the, the reasons that the, you know that, that Andrew was saying. Really, that so then uh, for me, it's a case of okay, how do we how do we build up from this from from this base that is already there, um, and it then become these kind of exemplar hubs, which is I think coming mm. out of what you were saying. I think this is what we ne what we need on the left is. Um, al you know, al alternative hubs, isn't it? Where we can show the alternative hubs of practice, where you can s see things working in a completely different way, mm. which then you know can be um, copied and, and replicated elsewhere. Really. Mm. So um, yeah, I mean, our, our, our institutions are uh, cl clearly part of that. I don't, I don't see the 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 problem i mean it, it's it's not that i was saying that they they that there's no left influence there at all um 
In fact, it's, it's the opposite. But it, but it's you know, the, 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 it's not enough as it is. It's quite clear. It's not the strongest basis to sort of operate from, don't you? I mean, in in, in terms of like the. Well, I, well, I thought that a glimpse, some sort of yeah. opening there in your in, in your talk, in terms of uh, you know a, a, a proper, even a, almost like a business argument, yeah, a managerial argument uh, that that you know for the uh, sort of return or the renaissance of sort of, you know sort of, sort of leftist thinking mm. uh, against uh, neoliberal inefficiency and so on and so mm. on and so on, you know, against the the, the myth of uh, distributed creativity and all that, yes, and and, and so on and so on and so on. And I'm. I'm just. I'm, I'm not convinced that sort of the, 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 a network of art institutions would be the best base to launch this, this attack from. But, but maybe that's wrong. But in some sense, we're already eminently doing it in the, in the, in the discussion now by the fact that the discussion is happening. You know. Um, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a, I mean, I, I think that um, you're picking up exactly on what I was saying as well. You, you know, you said why, you know, how ridiculous it would be to even imagine Tate as being um, this form. I think you're right on one level that um, arts institutions are a marginal part of a general economic uh, problem, of course, but they are interesting in terms of the way in which they, um, they are financed and they are interested in the way that they're organized. And they are also interesting because they, in a way, they're quite easy to recognize as an organizational form. They're less complicated structurally than a factory, for instance. OK? Just, I mean, not, maybe not a small factory, but a large factory. Yeah? No, maybe, maybe not the tape. Maybe, well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think it is. I mean, one of the problems is that these edifices are set up as if they're... Um, they're insurmountable, but I think we need to begin to understand them. But yes, of course, this is a fiction, okay, on one level, but it's, it's an imaginative fiction that is trying to propose that we do imagine that the Tate, it is possible to run the Tate on different grounds. Until we can begin to do that, then, you know, we're stuck in the, um, in the withdrawal that um, Mark has described, and I think that's what I'm trying to do. Now, on a practical basis, of course, one doesn't start with the Tate, one starts somewhere else. The the organizations I'm working with are small to medium scale organizations that have budgets of around, the, in the UK context, about £450,000 a year. Okay? Much smaller. Okay? And much more easy to, um, to recognize and to work out the, where the flows of money are, exactly what happens when um, uh, a patronage scheme is set up in order to match funds some public money, how, how that structure is 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 organized in such a way what the difficulties of of it are what at what moment might you be able to say no to that kind of thing what would be the alternative ways of raising the money so do you see what i mean it's i'm thinking very practically very pragmatically um and the people i'm working with are working on a much smaller budget but i don't see why it's not possible to imagine the same kind of uh research practice being undertaken at the Tate. In fact, I go further, I'd say, it's really important that we imagine and tr build up to that. And believe me, there are plenty of assistant curators at the Tate right now who are, you know, dragging their heels into work because they are so pissed off with the situation. They'd be the first people to begin this, this research. And in fact, to, to follow up on what Andrea was saying, the Tate is now uh, understanding that the, the corporate model it's 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 you know being run on it's it's not feasible because uh, the uh, you know people who invest uh, uh, in money in finance understand that it's not the kind of return that they are expecting so the Tate is pressurized now now to change and uh, and uh, and in fact the Tate is setting up something called Tate Exchange which is precisely an attempt to incorporate uh, different kind of economies within it. And it's very early stage, but the, the director of Tate Modern is trying to create uh, something called Tate Exchange, and the exchange is an exchange with society. So it's a new, it's it's a, it's a totally new thing. But the idea of gift, reciprocity, and all this kind of again, re the common, uh, you know, the, all these ideas that are kind of circulating now. And I think it's interesting. It's an interesting, you know, context to think about whether you know art organization want to be involved in that or not. Of course, it was already a big failure when there was this um, 
you know, not for sale yeah. uh, thing at the Tate, where in, you know, independent art organizations were invited. Uh, no in the Tate. soul for sale. No, yeah, no soul yeah. for sale. But 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 this time is different. It's, this time the Tate is is kind of trying to really re re reorganize itself along different lines. Can I use uh, use the microphone and uh, pose a question to connect Mao's and Mark's presentations in one, through one point? Yeah. Mao suggested there are new socialities appearing within the society, and I would translate tr uh, translated or seen through my own discourse. You talked about precariat, so unsalaried workers. That's how I read it, which kind of brings together in the same class artists unsalaried intellectual together with refugee, asylum seeker, etc., etc., etc. What is the workplace of precariat? Where do we bring that struggle then? It's no longer a factor, in my opinion, it is the street, it is the square. I think that's why we saw insurgent practices of this new precariat precisely where they took place. And I would like to bring it to the workplace, but I don't quite know how to imagine that workplace, really. But, the, but the, the, surely the space of the precariat isn't isn't the, isn't the square, is it? I mean, it's that. Why don't we? Um, I mean, I, and I agree. This is this is clearly a, a major problem that that you know, partly because of the shift from the factory, where there was um, you know all of the workers on one, under one roof, um, work clearly delimited from um, from non-work. All of those classic features of Fordism. Um, you know, to having uh, have disappeared. But um, uh, why is but why is the why is the square any more of a space for the precariat than um, than the workplace? Really. Perhaps. It, sorry. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to tap in on this because I, I fully agree uh, that. Uh, the way precariat is, is established is through the institutions, our political institutions and our institutions as such. So, um, and th this also brings me back to, to why, I understand the question of why bringing this battle through the art spaces uh, has to do with, and, and why should we bring it to the streets is because precariat is organized through these institutions. So I would say and thank you for your analysis of the uh, the victory of the, the right narrative against the leftist narrative it was a great analysis that that is where the battle should be should be um, um, you know, started or, or, or that's where it is located in, in winning the narrative uh, can I can I respond to Maria's question um, I think that I, for instance, I've been following the, the riots in Rio quite a lot because uh, uh, I've been I was uh, I've been I was there for for one year when when the whole thing started, and 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 these riots are uh, uh, basically come out from a from a composition of different kind of precariats. So there are you know university teachers, there are students, there are uh, computer workers who in Brazil are called the new middle class, but they really have. Uh, a level of education and level of income that are totally different. So they have a high education but very low income. There are informal workers who are also street vendors who paralyzed Bolivia the time of Morales, uh, uh, you know, uh, when Morales uh, uh, um, became president. Part of it was because uh, the, the lorry drivers and, and street vendors paralyzed Bolivia. So the idea of precariat is really cuts across different spaces. And I would say that, especially in relationship to urban struggles, the land is a very important issue. For instance, in, in, in Rome, Officina Zero, it's, uh, it's an ex-site of people who, who used to build a uh, uh, wagon for, for the railway. And, and in that case, they occupy the land, and, and people still use, there are still mechanics making machines, but also uh, a, a series of art collectives. So I think the precariat is really a, 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 comp a new composition, and I think it's very important also to talk about um, class because uh, you know that, that there is a, actually they are converging towards a, a similar class profile in, in economic terms, but nobody really understands it because people think, oh, these are people, you know, these are university, you know, students. So um, the other day someone was was calling this kind of riots in Rio as fascistic. So there is, there is a real need to understand what is a new class composition of this new precariat. 
I mean, I, well, just to, I mean, it seems to me that the, the you know the, the issue of the preca precarity is is strongly connected negatively with institutions or lack of institutionalization. You could say that there isn't an institution for and of the precarious. That's that's part of the, what is to be precarious, and that the existing institutions of the left, you know, such as trade unions, have you know been very slow to to adapt uh, to. Um, to represent or to involve uh, the, 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 the precariat in them, uh, but you know this is something that should happen. So I think it's it's something about what what is it that will connect these these what is it that make these struggles sustainable? Um, what is it that will make them uh, stick? What is it that will stop them from being just these periodic kind of upheavals? Um, which capital can just walk around, which is mm -hmm. which has been the situation really, mm -hmm. and I th you know that is some kind of ins institutional persistence. Um, mm -hmm. that I think is is, is required. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I just to I mean to echo what Mao and Mark are saying. I think that um, particularly Mao's ins Mao's insistence that the Commons is produced, uh, mm -hmm. and that it's That's produced right. through capital and along with capital. I think one of the things that I was trying to get to and didn't articulate adequately I guess in my in in my little um, talk was something about moving through neoliberalism rather than trying to skirt around the outside of it I mean I think that's what you're saying as mm. well but but if we if we understand that the, the Commons as something that's produced then it, it we can understand it as a form of production that also can move through. Um, and when I mean move through, I mean literally engage with uh, the uh, structures. And I'm mainly talking about the economic and financial structures, I guess, although I understand that neoliberalism is, is more than that, um, of arts institutions. And again, I would, rest, I would try to kind of make my claim on the basis that arts institutions are A, where we work, Okay, mm. so I mean, there's a very pragmatic mm. reason for starting with arts institutions as well, which is where, I mean, I don't want to make assumptions, but I'm presuming most people in this room uh, are either artists or curators or, or, or cultural workers in some form. I'm sorry if that's an assumption too far. Um, so we all have uh, relationships with. So you know, on the on on one level, it's it's a kind of starting block. It's a place. To, it's mm. a place to work. It's a place to, um, to delve into, to try to understand. So I'm talking about very pragmatic things. One of the ways of producing the commons is to make um, the financial structures of any organization transparent. So it's very simple. I mean, you know, it's like she says, it's easy, like that. But I mean, try, try, um, try um, finding out the structures of an arts institution's financing. It's incredibly difficult to actually find the kind of, the nuanced, detailed structures of where money comes from. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a year's work and it involves, you know, really trying, and you can't get that information within, uh, within democracies, uh, you know, within certain dem democratic frameworks, a certain amount of that information is publicly accessible, but only the headlines, only anonymized, okay? So, you know, where, how, it, that's the kind of work I'm talking about. It's not, it's not, um, it's not glamorous. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just thinking, since, since you were talking about um, precarity, and um, I guess as an artist, um, and you you work very much outside of organizations, especially when you're just starting, and you also often have to work very interdisciplinary as as a freelancer, for instance, working not only within the arts, but being very interdisciplinary and working online and stuff like that. Um, I was just wondering, how do you see this, these structures seep into more of an interdisciplinary approach? I mean, work, just working with other fields in, in society and, and how could that be seen as a, as a benefit to, to these institutional structures? Yeah. I mean, I've got a response. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. thanks. I, I mean, I, uh, one very kind of pragmatic response to that would be, I think it's really important, again, to, to, to state it again, that we understand the, the, the different ways that people are paid in different, in, in different um, 
institutions or get recompense, whether it's pay structures or not. One of the things that I was involved in um, a couple of years ago was a, um, was a, a talk, uh, a kind of marathon effectively at Art Brussels, um, which was trying, I know, the, the, I mean, the, the strategic, it was that I was invited to do it by a group of artists who wanted to place this discourse in Art Brussels for very particular reasons. And um, one of the things that they did was they invited people from, um, and they're not, they're not it, it depends what you define as interdisciplinary. Of course, I'm talking about a situation where there were a few people from the field of science, but mainly from theatre, from visual art, from music. And one of the things we established very quickly is that, um, that the way that you're hired if you work in theatre which is a much more unionized profession in certain contexts, not in every context, but in European traditions, or your European kind of histories of unionism, is very different from um, in the visual arts where there isn't a kind of support structure that would say, well, if you're going to hire this person to be an actor or a stage designer or a sonographer or whatever, or a director or a, a, a lighting designer, then, there's the, then this is the rate, this is the rest that they need to have, this is their entitlement for lunch breaks, etc., etc. Now, of course, that's notwithstanding the fact that there are many, many out-of-work actors who are, you know, or people that work in and out of things, but it, it, it became a really important talking point for us to, to realise the differences between those two economies. So I would say on an economic, socio-economic level, it's really important for us to compare differences. That doesn't kind of help, but I think it's useful information to have in our heads. Um, I have a question for you. What do you mean by interdisciplinary? I mean, uh, it's it's uh, is in the yeah, yeah. Uh, the kind of uh, does Andrea did Andrea answer to your question, or you're thinking about interdisciplinarity as a way of uh, rethinking? I don't know the political or, yeah. or. Well, I was just thinking and looking at my own situation. I mean, I haven't been hired by anybody for the last I don't know five years, mm. and I was just hoping to to see if there was an an answer. I mean, if if this if this new way of working as a precarious worker could be as a benefit, seen as a benefit to, to new organizational structures, if, like, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Well, um, I think we, part of this comes back to this question of the front and back end of neoliberalism, isn't it? Like, uh, that the, you know, how was neoliberalism successfully sold to people? It was sold that they would uh, have more freedom, and they would be less bored fundamentally, you know, because uh, you know the, the 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 old equation of boredom of security with boredom really. <laughs> if you're secure, you must be bored. Um, so okay, you don't we don't we don't want to be bored anymore. Therefore, we'll give up security, um, um, you know, in in order to escape boredom. Um, but I think the result of that was just generalized anxiety, which is which is part of you know the the, the precarious condition. Um, so then we can say, well, what, what is it that would stop us being precarious in a way we don't want to be? Um, you know, that, 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 again, would surely be some kind of institutional support, either direct or indirect. I mean, I, I think that's what we can, that's what we can say. Um, when we talk about the example of music, you know, what uh, in the UK, let us say, when it was, um, had a, you know, kind of the great creative ex efflorescence of, of popular music in the UK in the 60s and the, the, the early 80s. Um, what is it supported that? Not direct funding, but you know, uh, indirect funding, unemployment benefit, housing benefit, um, you know, our, our, um, student grants, this kind of thing. Um, it's, it seems to me then that that, 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 that need to be clear about what it, what, what it is we don't like about precarity. It seems to me is this mandatory insecurity. The lack of, um, you know, particularly from, from the perspective of kind of artistic production, it's the lack of unpressured time, isn't it? It's, it's the unavailability of unpressured time uh, in order to, well, you can produce something without knowing where it's going to go. Um, you know, that is, that's, that's what's made available by, by certain kinds of uh, institutional support. Um, and I think that's, you know, that, that's the kind of, that, that's what we need to be, to be struggling for. And it, no, and but not to the old ones. We can't just go back to social democracy. I mean, it seems to me this is the, the debate around things like something like basic income uh, is is not only about social justice, it's also about cultural production, possibilities for cultural production. Mm -hmm. You know, if 
so I, so I, I think it's, it's partly about reclaiming security. Security does not necessarily equal boredom. Uh, co contrary to neoliberalism, you know, s certain kinds of security are the preconditions for, for exactly what neoliberalism claims that it's offering, i.e. novelty, innovation, etc., but which it actually doesn't offer. But can I ask you what you mean by the, a new form of work? Uh, you, you were saying, could you say a little bit more about... I just wanted to know a bit more about your question, because I don't feel like we're answering it quite. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to take all this time. No, um, no. It's, it's, it's what it's for. Well, I, I was just hoping that, you know, that these organizational structures and mm. being employed in... In an, in an institution seem almost utopian to me, you know, mm. work, while my work life is constitutes mm. of working mm. yeah. online or working with something completely different, translation, and then doing mm. art practice, and then working with, you know, like community organizations or working with something completely different. Mm. And and I was thinking maybe these, these kind of, um, in in the light of a feeling that you know, it it is almost to me a utopian idea of these organizations that you can how how you can how you can uh, improve on that maybe you could think of a way to 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 sort of be inspired by this precarious situations that many are in and and see it as a, a fresh take on on yeah sort of interdisciplinary mm. approach from many different fields, from online participation, um, that could be, yeah, like, different. Mm. Mm. Can I make a small addition yeah. to this? Because I recognize from, Cecil uh, is, is part of the learning group at the back, mm. and we did semester on the notion of survival, and mm. the, we went through all the theories from Benjamin's afterlife to you name it, you know, went to, through Arendt and Agamben and Ranciere and Negri, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then comes the question at some point, as an artist at an art school, how do I survive myself? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that's one of those questions I simply do not know how to mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. However, I would propose, I, I used to propose to all the students and members of the learning place a definition of survival. It's a, it's a shift from critique, Mm -hmm. paraphernalia of the modern, mm -hmm. to proposal and action, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we do with this critique? We know the situation, mm -hmm. we realize how yeah. complex it is, so what is to be done would be a question that could help us mm -hmm. to survive ourselves as artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm probably saying it also slightly out of a panic that I sit on the next panel and as a practitioner I might be asked <laughs> one so I just want to prevent uh, yeah. you know being uh, in that situation myself but that's the that's the complex question yeah and Simon wants to stop me no, from it's, it's, posing it, it it's just I think that there is with, with this discussion of precarity and artistic work and or art production I just think there is this confusion uh, because I think from the modern era so you can then discuss whether artists are precursors of, of precarity mm -hmm. they might be they might not be I think that, I think that's I think that's debatable, but they were never the idea of the autonomous artist exactly because they're autonomous was never to be a wage laborer. So so the the, the idea yeah. was to be a, an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and this is still how artists are trained. Yeah. You know, we were, they are trained Absolutely. as entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 it seems strange to, uh, to 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 kind of import that kind of unionism that is the right to work, yeah. because the, the the claim of artists historically was the right not to work like anybody else. Yeah. So yeah. there is that, I think there's just those, those confusions uh, has to be, or let's mm. say historical conditions has to be mm. uh, part of the equation if yes. we see uh, artists as part of a precarity, which, mm. which, which I think we can, but it just needs to be but uh, what would you reframed do? a bit. How would you push that then, Simon? Because it would seem to me that on the one hand, one of, if, if, this, if this change in, or this, it's not a change, it's not like, it, if, if, if we can succeed, in um, trying to open up institutions to be something else. It's certainly not, as Simon says, to employ all the artists for, for these mm. reasons. But um, it would mean that the institution
conversation would become a little bit less glamorous. It would probably become a bit more like a community centre, you know, in the fact that it would, it, the, the mundanities of daily practice would become, would come much more to the fore. Yeah? Um, and of course, there are institutions that are already that are already run like that, and many of my friends that are artists work in them on a regular basis, and they might occasionally get a, a show or set up a show themselves somewhere else. But their their work comes from working as a community practitioner or in an educational capacity in one of these situations. And I think that, but that work, I mean, one of the problems that this modernist artist has to to kind of make him into him him into a cartoon um, <laughs> is. Um, is the, um, the, the desire to disassociate from that kind of practice, that kind of work. And so I do, I think you're, I mean, how, so what do we do with that disparity? Because on the one hand, um, in order to, to, to try to push some of these organisational ideas forward, it's going to mean a, dissim, a required dissimulation of that figure. Yet on the other hand, as you quite rightly say, we're in love with that figure. Well, I also, are we? I don't know. <laughs> uh, can I? Uh, yeah, I think is the problem is also that we always frame in a debate in terms of work, mm -hmm. and this is both you know modernist and and uh, and and I guess uh, quite Western. I mean the kind of uh, you know the idea that, that 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 only you know we define ourselves through the right to work is is quite uh, a, a small portion of what we can claim as a right, and that's why I was I was mentioning. Latin America in the 70s or 80s, because artists then were looking at, uh, you know, a right to the public. They were, you know, right to citizenship. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if you live in a city, then you could articulate your, your, your series of rights in terms of right to the city, you know, right to, to living, right to uh, health, right to, you know, to the resources that are around you. And I think it's that, that's where the connection between art group and other kind of groups happens. So, so perhaps we also can think about artists as a, not necessarily in terms of, you know, their work or they do. And that's an old issue, of course, because it, it goes to the core of what, as an artist, you think your skill or your identity are. Mm -hmm. and. But, you know, I think it'd be good to return to this demand for the right not to work. Yes, rather, exactly. You know, rather, exactly. than, the, rather yeah. than the, yeah, you know, uh, the demand for secure employment. Yeah. Security without employment, I think. It's, you know, that's part of what's... This, stake in the basic income kind of discussions, isn't it? Yeah. But not just for yeah. artists, huh? No, 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 no. no. Exactly. But, it, it, but it's also that it means that that possibility of, uh, of artistic practice or, uh, is opened up, isn't it? If, yeah. if, there's, if, you know, if people uh, have more unpressured time, then they can uh, engage in a more artistic activity. Yeah. If people are, you know, what does unpressured time mean? It mean <laughs> time when you're not working, which is almost no time for, for many of us now. So I just want to make one brief comment to this and then I'll let this poor woman get to say something. So <laughs> um, I think there is, in a, in a, just in a, to have a kind of former West perspective on this, there is of course a historical model for uh, artists being unionized and employed, if you will, by the state, which is the socialist model. Yeah. Yeah. So there of course the exclusionary lines were those who were accepted as official artist and could be in the union would also automatically have shows and automatically have funding. Mm -hmm. And everybody else, ironically, the generation of artists who are now being historicized as the true artists of uh, Eastern Europe, the true conceptualists, were not artists in any nominal sense because they weren't in unions, they weren't having shows mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the socialist mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so there's that uh, irony because now I think that, that f uh, you know, there's no organizational form uh, uh, to correspond to that in the West, but the idea that an artist is something sanctioned officially, namely through education, which is the same as what the artist union said before, is completely dominant. Mm -hmm. So, but there's none of, this, none of the security, but there's the same exclusion, there's the same monopoly on what constitutes an artist that you had in Eastern Europe, but you have none of the security. You have only the kind of mm. uh, uh, complete precarity. Yeah. And that, I think, relates to this institutional question, because I think uh, the, the part of the problem, and I think it's good if this then can be done through investigation, is that it is impossible. You can discuss small organizations, small, small art institutions in, 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 in a certain way, but with larger institutions, it becomes, becomes less and less transparent, mm -hmm. less and less possible to discuss them, partly to find out where their economy is. And the way that artists are used in this is also part of a kind of feudal system, basically, of collectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. Right, and they also now have a bigger, bigger influence on 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 institutional policies. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's one uh, complication. 
uh, that maybe you can find that out. Maybe you can excavate those figures. That's possible. That's but the other complication, I think, which should be part of the debate here, is how does people then constitute, people in the art world, constitute a public sphere? Because at the moment, I don't think that we do. Mm -hmm. There's this discussion that, oh, there's a lot of left ideology in art institutions. I think that's highly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. I think there's very little of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I also think that how do we constitute a public sphere from those who don't work and those of us who do work and of course can politicize our workplace, but there's still a lot who are outside, not because of withdrawal, but because they've been kicked outside, mm -hmm. and because they're left outside. Mm -hmm. So with that, <laughs> I want to... Now I have two questions. <laughs> okay, um, the first one, uh, could you give maybe some more examples of this changed ways of working? these new kinds of practices at art institutions, like apart from this uh, transparency thing, uh, what, what kind of changes you would imagine in art institutions okay. concerning these organizational mm -hmm. uh, structures? Yeah. Uh, and maybe, maybe together with some information on how these changes are uh, being introduced. Mm -hmm. in, because this is also yep. very difficult. And second question, um, I wonder if there can be any kind of exchange of knowledge between art institution and the university mm -hmm. in that respect. Because mm -hmm. I can imagine that you, uh, as employees of a university, you have also your own experiences in that field on Absolutely. how to introduce these changes and maybe this, they could be also useful for, yeah. for us. Well, or, or, or how to fail to introduce uh, changes in an, in an educational context. I mean, of course, the, the battle of the university is a parallel battle. Oh, oh, it's actually a battle. I would say that it's not a battle yet in arts institutions. Um, and maybe the battle is the wrong word. Um, so practic pragmatic things. So, uh, so, the, so I'm currently working with a, ser a, a group of small arts institutions. They are... Um, they're three very different institutions. They're all based in London, but they all have very different, um, uh, what could I want to say? I, there are ideological differences between them, I would say that. Um, one is Chisholm Hale Gallery, the other is The Showroom, and the third one is Studio Voltaire. So they're, they're three different projects, and they've all um, come together to, um, in order to apply for, and they were, they were um, successful in their application, a grant from the Arts Council of England um, called a Catalyst Grant. Is it worth me going into the details? This might get very boring. Or you just tell me no, if it gets really. About organizational form, so well, it is. Boring. I mean, this is this is the level at which it is. Okay. Um, now, th because there's a really important, uh, because I think that part of my learning process and beginning to work with them, and I should suggest, I should say to you very clearly that this is something that is that we're beginning to think about implementing. Okay. So this is not. There's not. There isn't. There isn't a new way of working. Okay. Um, and I, I don't think there is ever going to be a new way of working. There are going to be some attempts at some changes. Okay, so I think just to, you know, there's not a kind of, you know, much as we'd like to, there isn't a kind of, you know, like, if you swallow this pill, then everything will change. So, um, so uh, the, um, so, so they got money in order to develop their entrepreneurial skills from the Arts Council, okay? So that's the first kind of um, moment of, um, of, of attention, one could say. And each of those institutions has a very different relationship to the idea of entrepreneurialism. Some of them are much better at getting private money from patrons than others. Ironically, the ones that are less good at it are the most worried about it, okay? I mean, not ironically, obviously, in a sense. So, so, they, so, the, um, so the idea is to work with those, and I've spent the last year and a half interviewing the workers in those institutions across the levels to try and work out how um, the changing capacities of finance in their institutions that are bought on by the demand for entrepreneurialism with because they've re they receive roughly a third of their income from uh, the government from the state that's quite high they're quite successful in that regard most arts institutions in the UK receive far less than that or don't receive any at all. Um, and so struggle to survive in the same ways that we talked about with you before by, by working you know, in partnerships and, 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 um, and, and sometimes not surviving and, and, and closing down. Um, often, in fact. So, so the, the idea is now to work, to find forms that um, 
mean that those institutions um, are, first of all, transparent about where the money comes from, and secondly, um, are um, interested in or developing a series of values that they will aspire to, that not they will aspire to, that they will espouse within their institutions um, that are based on uh, the, the premises that I've already talked to you about. So are based on equal pay, freedom of speech across the institution with all the workers, um, transparency of wage, um, and uh, across all the institution, uh, across all the levels of the institution, and um, and transparency about the way in which artists are commissioned, and transparency about the ways in which um, the institutions work collaboratively with other institutions. So these are the very basic remits. Okay, so it's not. And, and that may or may not, and is already beginning to have small changes on the way people work together, but it's not, um, it's not radically transformative. Now, these institutions are all institutions that have um, four people, full-time equivalent workers. So they're really small. That might mean that they employ 10 people, yeah, or 12 people at different, you know, at different levels, but they're really small. So, so it's much... It's a, it's, it's, it's a microcosmic um, uh, beginning, if you will. And, um, and principally at the moment, the discussions are about how much information people are prepared to um, make public. And that's literally, so, so the conversation over the past four months, three months has been, are you prepared to tell people about that? And it's literally been that, and, and, and it, it, so, so it's 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 and that's the level of of change and it's boring and it's mundane and and that's all, that's all I can do and it's not I it's a we we're working together but we have very different opinions about it and as I say the directors of those institutions point in very different directions so it's like that so it's it's not it's not you know I told you it would be definitely boring. Um, I think my my question is less of a question than I th maybe a proposal with a question mark, and it's kind of a chronicle editing as I go along. So sorry if I kind of <laughs> not have a linear linear talk. Um, I work at Casco, um, and since last year we started a research uh, project called Unusual Business with un between question marks or between brackets, let's say. So it's usual, but also unusual. And actually, we take also the theory of Catherine Gibson as part of that, or as its basis. And actually, we realized that instead of speaking just about community economies, we were talking about commoning as a practice. Um, and also commoning and community economies in relation to the big society, in which actually more social visions of economy are instrumentalized uh, and used. In Dutch, it's called the participatie maatschappij, so the participation society. Mm -hmm which was actually kind of uh, put forward in the last speech by the newly instated uh, king, mm. that everything should be kind of fall under this guise of participatie maatschappij. Um, and I think that the idea of commoning comes from the notion of being in common. So the whole ontology within commoning is different. And I think that's also kind of related to what you said about being humble, mm. and maybe also to what you said um, about feeling safe or kind of having a sense of belonging that is not necessarily about like practical or financial security, but about more like a spiritual, personal f sense of being in a place that you feel safe and also to kind of develop and uh, explore your own thoughts in that space. And I think also how the reason why I started with unusual business is because we took the quote of Catherine Gibson, the economy is something we do, not something that does things to us as a starting point. And I think the way we think about it, because Unusual Business is a collaboration between Casco and Kritische Studenten Utrecht, which is a critical leftist student collective here in Utrecht that are either still in the university or have graduated. And they're from various different fields, from biology, from sociology, anthropology, anthropology art um, management as well. Um, and we're thinking about the art institution instead of like, we, of course we're making it and we're using it and we're organizing, but actually about really using the art organization um, for different kind of purposes. So instead of having it as a main goal to make an institution or to keep it alive or sustain it, to actually use it. Um, 
So, and that means by using it, 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 it also becomes pars with different agents. So not just the people who are in the institution's domestic space, so the people that actually, like, I am a wage laborer for Costco, you could say, but also the people that we collaborate with um, and that usually we try to pay, which is not always possible and it's also, like, a difficult point, mm -hmm. but still we, we have it in, the, in, in our heads that it is important to. Um, and I think in that sense, um, this idea of changing an organizational structure, the man management of it, I think is this um, porousness of the organization itself. So also not to be scared to not immediately be a brand or be captured in one kind of bag, but actually you have multiple bags or multiple identities that are fluent and that change uh, whoever you come in contact with. And these are usually also collaborations that are not immediately visible. Um, for instance, like to clean our space, like we clean the toilet ourselves. But we're also thinking because it's like our space is bigger, we just moved across the street. So it actually it takes up a lot of our time that also we don't have so much time in general. Um, so we're thinking of how to collaborate with a coalition that we worked with before, which is Domestic Workers Netherlands, to kind of think about how to implement these collaborations that are in fact based on solidarity uh, into our daily working rhythms. Uh, the same goes for the opening. We worked with a vegan chef that we've been working with before who has not got a job at the moment and is part of a feminist collective called um, Feministies for Zet here in Utrecht. And we kind of try and find different ways in which like these small things that are not visible but then are an inherent part of our practice to work with. Another is the fact that we always have lunch together but we try and get our lunch not from Albert Heijn, which we usually do, or from an ecological shop, which is also kind of still monopolized here, but from a market that is produced local goods, for instance. Um, and another thing is that the interior garden in our space is uh, developed by Wietzke Maas, who's also here. <laughs> and she did research in, she does a lot of research in general into the ecology of the city and how to live together with different creatures, in a sense, than humans. Um, and she made a beautiful interior garden with ferns, do I say it, varens? And Utrecht is the fern city, and they kind of, ferns are plants that, well, Wietz can, tell, can speak much better about it than I, <laughs> I can, but like they kind of go into corners where nobody else comes, or they kind of find their own way. Um, but she worked, for instance, just with plants who are, um, that were naturally produced, so not kind of grown uh, quicker through, like, um, I say it like un not natural uh, means. Anyway, these are just kind of small examples in which we as an organ organization really try and learn from the artists that we work with. And not only from the artists, but from the different groups and kind of also implement or kind of work together in spaces that are not visible, which we're always kind of um, in need to be visible constantly. And I think this visibility is, uh, it's like publicness, has different forms and different shapes and different kind of um, degrees in a sense. So I think, and, and I'm not saying it's a totally innovative or entrepreneurial or <laughs> way of working, but I think these small things, they create kind of this maybe humble attitude, which is also very easily overthrown maybe, this idea of being humble. I don't know. Anyway, it's kind of, you said you had a proposition. I think that was the proposition. <laughs> <laughs> I said a proposition with a question mark, so I think the question mark became bigger as I spoke. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. I, my proposition I think, was about you. To be clear, I, I, when I use the term humble, I, I'm actually not talking about a kind of spiritual humility. I'm talking about a kind of uh, the. I, I think this also relates to the kind of the individual I, that, that we might that, that we that that. The kind of managerial processes the, the, that I'm talking about might mean that we can't always be the individual authors that we, that the, the structures of artistic and curatorial production that we're enmeshed within uh, necessitate and dictate. So it's more a kind of, um, you know, it's like, so it, it, yes, of course, it's about cleaning the toilets, but it's also about kind of going, well, who's going to, you know, uh, you know, how can we find this information? And, you know, it's a long and boring process. So it's, it's also that kind of, that's what I mean by humility. I, just a comment, I really like the idea of um, support structures. And I, I can't, I don't so much, I'm not a kind of a, 
religious person, so I don't identify with the spirituality in that sense, but I like the idea, for instance, of friend, the support structures, Celine Condorelli, idea of friendship, you know, this kind of support structure that come from micro practices. And I can, you know, I, I, I can sympathize. I mean, I really like the way you describe Casco working. Yeah. Can you say something more about, you were telling about the common and the uh, concept of exclusion. Yeah. Can you say something more about that? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't want to kind of structure this as a kind of a, um, a lecture kind of format, but uh, um, I'm sure the, kind of the, the common is not a place that is public, right? And it's, 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 it's not a place that everybody can access. And the whole issue of the common came out in the 70s with someone Harding say, you know, the common is a tragedy because uh, people are not rational enough to use the public good because there are so many, too much people, too many people for limited resources, and so we should privatize. And then, obviously, they, then came out Eleanor Armstrong, who was a fantastic economist who kind of realized that, in fact, there were structural exclusion in the commons all over the world, especially in non-capitalist places, but also in the way people use water in LA. You know, even, even the West had this kind of structure. But the main point is that really the common is a space where you are not, you know, where there are rules that are very strict and there are monitoring uh, uh, protocols, there are management protocols, there are decisional protocols. So it's not a free area, it's not free resources. It's, it's, a, it's a space that is produced through active engagement uh, with the resources and, and obviously. Uh, you know, anthropologists produce a vast and kind of romantic literature about how Aboriginal use land through poetry or, or you know, storytelling. But it, it is true, the common can be produced, you know, as a, as a kind of a active practice that can be also artistic, not necessarily economic. I have a question that uh, continues from there. Um, I think you you propose that the art institution would also be a, a place where the commons can be enacted or uh, experienced or exper experimentally uh, practiced. But what is then the exclusion? What do we have to exclude? Uh, what do we, who have to, do we have to exclude there? Well, that, that's the problem with the common, right? I, I wouldn't want to exclude anybody. But there is, for instance, people who talk about the common, uh, I mean, there is a long, uh, tradition of kind of subsistence theory from von Mies and ecofeminism and, and people who talk about common criticize cooperativism because cooperativism is a way, a step up in which, in which there are some, some new mechanism of exclusion that are based basically on distinction between who produces surplus value and who doesn't. So this is already a step up by something that sometimes is necessary because otherwise cooperative fail because you don't have the technical people who run them. So, you know, if I come out to the technicalities of the common, it's very difficult not to exclude people. Um, but perhaps, again, you know, we can think about a, a fluid way, discursive way, open way, in which all this, this contradiction can be negotiated. And, and there is a big theorist of cooperativism now in America called Richard Wolff, and he's, uh, he's uh, becoming quite trendy with Obama. And I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of really amazing how, again, there is a risk of this being incorporated in, uh, in, uh, in a new kind of new spirit of capitalism. But these are all discussions to be had. Um, isn't that just, just a little comment to this? Isn't, isn't that that in terms of art institution as potentially an institution of the common? We need to think in both the terms of ownership of that institution and of governance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to make sure yeah. that it's not about making an exhibition about the commons, yeah. exactly. but yeah. it's about the yeah. commons becoming the method of your existence. Yeah. 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 And I think there is no art institution of that sort mm. uh, I would know about, although there are a number of institutions at this very moment that are gesturing towards that. Mm. And I think it's specifically in Italy, you mentioned the um, Teatro Valle Occupato, uh, which is extraordinarily interesting effort. Um, I think their refusal of both the state and the market is potentially threatening. Mm. But there are other much more pragmatically oriented maybe, pragmatically in the good, good sense of the word, in, um, initiatives such as in Croatia, for example, and we, we've been at the same uh, debate that organized together also with Witzke Maas um, uh, by the European Culture Foundation, 
um, 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 or, uh, organizations in Croatia, in Zagreb, uh, of reclaiming the city, where artists, activists, architects get together an interactive negotiation with both these players, the state and the market, having in mind that what we, what we, the vision we still kind of maintain in our world is that there is a division between the private and the public, but essentially both fields, both territories are um, influenced and formatted by the same, namely the market forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we know how the, how the governments behave at this moment. The Netherlands is, a, a, is an example uh, par excellence. That is the market, actually, that is kind of dictating all the decision-making in the so-called public sphere. What's happening in Croatia at this moment is that they try to reframe this reclaiming the city activities, uh, reclaim, um, uh, they try to re-articulate the private-public partnerships uh, w with which you started, Andra, into... <laughs> public civic partnerships mm. and actually they go as far as forcing the the powers that be and the jurisdiction jurisdiction and legal system to allow for another quality of partnership within this uh, within which art institutions can exist mm. so it's 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 not just to reclaim i buck and the institution of the commons that's not yeah, the yeah. process it's yeah. creating completely and fighting it's a lengthy process finding for completely new environment mm. within which this can take place in my opinion mm. and un until this is this is possible or until we even begin uh, doing that I think we just yeah we just uh, yeah. you know need to try to understand what that is because I really if you know an art institution of the common mm. I'd be interested to to, yeah. to learn about that because it's more complex more difficult specifically if you think this is this is the matter of governance and ownership. Mm. And no, I, think I, completely, I, I completely agree with that. And I do think, I mean, I think that therefore Mao's definition of, of the commons as being a, a, a methodology of production, I think is, is really um, important. That, that, that it's not about um, producing an arts institutions and then having the common in it. Yeah, so it's not that at all, even at the level of kind of structures. Um, but it's absolutely about recognizing that production of the common does involve hard and difficult conversations about who runs the place, how, what, the, what the network of decision-making structures is, and all of those things. One of the things that I've been looking at as well is, um, you know, um, of course, this, this is a, this is a, um, a structure that nominally uh, is, is productive in Germany, but also this is back as well, which is um, subscription model organizations, which is often uh, one, one of the models of organization that people use to try and move away from private financing. So, and is, that a, is subscription a civic model, an alternative civic model? But then who is included and excluded? What are the problems of it, et cetera, et cetera? But these are the conversations we need to have. And they're about m financial modelling, primarily, you know. And then they're also spatial, and they're also to do with, you know, uh, who gets invited in, not spatially, who we're speaking to, you know. And I think that those are, that, but it's precisely at this level that the political discussion in art needs to happen at the moment. And briefly, following from what Maria was saying, it's. Uh, the law has an immense relevance. I mean, all these experiments were, were possible because uh, there were legal activists and lawyers who, in Italy, uh, legalized the common. So Teatro Valle uh, started a series of occupation by artists that was incredible. Uh, because basically uh, now in Rome it's legal to occupy public spaces a lot because culture is, is a common, is recognized as, as a public common. So, and, and so that, that's as important also to kind of push it also from the point of view of legal activism. How, how does that work? Could you exemplify that in some way? Well, the, they, they, for instance, the police cannot kick them out because, uh, because the place is Fondazione now. Right. And so basically they have the right to stay. And, uh, and, and because uh, uh, the, the, the municipality of Rome says that it's much better to have a, a theater that is run by artists than, than run by, uh, you know, a manager. So, so, but that's you know, that's Italy. Maybe in, in two months' time that will change. Uh, <laughs> but that's the state now, and there's a big commission, national commission, that's uh, that's working on that as well. I think that's a good example of what I call ind indirect action, though. Yeah. Where, um, yeah. you know, the, the the legal 
this legal, yeah. uh, you it's know, political yeah. space uh, is important, uh, articulated with, you know, direct action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you shouldn't shouldn't necessarily yeah. see the two as opposed to one yeah. another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good example of the way in which they yeah. they can and must work together. Really. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it is crucial because when Teatro Valle Occupato started to occupy their own theatre in um, um, in uh, revolt uh, against the neoliberal takeover of that historical building because a commercial a center commercial mall was supposed to build there, be built there. This was 2011. It was essentially a criminal act. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Who are you to claim mm. this is yours? Yeah. Well, they were like, let's take back what's ours, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's it's not a romantic process either. It's yeah. it's about you know evictions and police raids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Mm. Yet until today, they occupy in a way. They play every night. Yeah. They it's extremely well-visited place with enormous energy, but still extremely complex. But it's, it takes so long to build, actually, mm. to create circumstances within which a change can happen. Mm. But, I mean, the redefinition of what is criminal is crucial to the success of neoliberalism as well. Yes. For instance, criminalizing, you know, union activities, for instance. You know, yes. this was during, in the UK, and, and not only the UK, but exactly. uh, you know, the UK is a good example of, of um, uh, that process, such, such that you know, if uh, any action by a trade union that's in any way effective is now illegal in the UK, yeah. mm. you know, leading to a situation in which, you know, Tony Blair said we've got the most stringent anti-trade union laws in the Western world, and he was proud of that. Mm. <laughs> I was wondering whether maybe on um, curating programmes we should now teach law. <laughs> Huh? I mean, you know, what, in what way does curatorial education need to change in order to, to, to proceed in this way? Yeah, I mean, in all ways, yeah. But I mean, you know, it's a space that can be used as a training space. So, you know, how about, I don't know whether Goldsmith's purse would allow this, but how about, you know, <laughs> you know how, get, how, about, how about getting some legal, um, some legal training going? It would seem to be an intelligent thing to do going mm -hmm. on this. Probably my question would be a little bit apart from previous discussion uh, concerned with uh, uh, more micro-political or an uh, routine uh, and interesting <laughs> activities of the left, which could be, could be do done in institutions and so, and so on and so on. But I was just provoked by one note from uh, uh, Mark's uh, talk, uh, Mark, Mark Fisher talk about this uh, that left need to push up the level of ambitions uh, mm -hmm. to return to this more classical old school model and he quoted this post uh, stalinist economics uh, which and management which were uh, probably very critical to capitalists and uh, were, they were thinking that they can manage the world better and so on and so on and it, it was indeed and like, actually being the uh, from this part of the world and was especially <laughs> provoked by these uh, notes. But generally, I, my question, or it's not just very naive, like Papa by the sky is blue or <laughs> whatever it could be, uh, but my question would be what, and, and, and uh, what would be this, um, how to say, and actually, uh, what would be this drug, this strong drug which would push up all to this uh, upper level of ambitions? Because uh, I, I, I mean, I mean, uh, everybody would uh, would agree that we should be ambitious. Even neoliberal managers they prefer ambitious, non-depressed, non um, I don't know a person uh, with <laughs> than a very ambitious, uh, career-oriented, uh, successful. I, don't, I mean, individual. So. I, I mean, just what would be this drug? I, I, I have the hypothesis that, for, for example, uh, recent uh, uprisings and revolts in the Middle East uh, uh, or other parts of the world w would be such a drug, or like in Kantian, we're producing a sort of revolutionary enthusiasm and whatever. But practically, I'm just thinking, but I'm not, it's not critique, actually, it's just, mm. just, I'm just questioning what would be the party discipline or, I don't know, a new sort of ascetic or sacrificial subjectivity, what, whatever. <laughs> just <laughs> questioning. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, of course, but I mean, I, I, but I don't. Again, I don't think we should take it on face value that neoliberal, you know, neoliberals want people to be, you know, ambitious, self-motivated, etc. They just say that. You know, they they. I think you know they're quite happy with people being depressed actually, as long as they're depressed. As long as they're, you know, it's a manageable level of depression, isn't it? That's 
that, that, that's kind of the, 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 the key thing with neoliberalism. You, you can't be so depressed you can't work. You can't be so uh, elated that you think, why am I doing this shit? You know, that kind of, um, that middle range of kind of, oh, God, I've got to do this. Uh, you know, that's, 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 they try and cultivate that. There's no alternative. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I think they demand depression really rather than um, want to oppose it. But, yeah, I mean, just to be clear, I wasn't saying go back to an old school model. It's more to go back to the, those old ambitions, not necessarily what, you know, the, 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 the infrastructures which, which house those ambitions. I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to uh, return to the, the Soviet system under any model. Um, but, I mean, I, I think actually that, you know, you're talking about a drug, that, um, but I think those things have not succeeded exactly. Um, that event, those are, you know, that, that we saw in the Middle East, we saw in, um, you know, in, uh, uh, parts of Europe also, you know, those, those uprisings or, or, or events weren't enough. I think that's one, th that's one thing that's uh, increasingly clear, that events don't necessarily change anything. That, you know, that, that we can have this, you know, it's part of post-68 mentality, everything's about events, blah, blah, blah. but, um, you know, the, the, there was no neoliberal event. You know, they didn't didn't require event. It was an attritional, um, you know, attritional hegemonic takeover that that um, allowed them to have total dominance. Um, and you you can't you can't just re um, repeal that with 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 events. Um, but I think it's that, you know what it, I mean what what would what would motivate people ultimately is is, is the question. Well. Um, I think it's this question, this issue of hubs again, a, 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 well, a hub struggle, I think. A, a hub struggle where we, you know, um, successfully won something, um, took it over, where um, a lot of the forces that we've got were coordinated together, we, we were an, actual, an actual victory was won, um, and that this could, this could resonate and be replicated elsewhere. That, that this, is the, this, this is the kind of drug, a successful struggle is, it, is a drug, I, I, uh, you know, to, to counteract the kind of tranquilizing drug of, uh, of neoliberalism, really. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that would get us into a position of a virtuous circle rather than a vicious, um, vicious circle, which we're now, of things endlessly failing, com confirming the kind of standard depression, making people deactivate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I favour putting mm. something in the water. I mean, you know, I think <laughs> that wholesale change. But, but I, but I mean, but Mark's absolutely right. The drug has been crisis, you know, and and so we and so we've the the crisis has produced a um, a, a high, and then you know, but it's been an unequal high, or a, you know, whatever the drug metaphors escape me. But this comes back to Mao's point that he made in his presentation, which was, um, you know, what's sad about um, the resistant movements. Uh, not, I'm going to try and quote you, but you said, I can't remember what you said. You said react, uh, the Commons has been reactive, and actually, mm -hmm. what would it take to me mm -hmm. to make it? A kind of a, a kind of everyday reality. So what what's the? Mm. I mean, I was really struck. That seemed to me to be really absolutely clear. What, how do we transform from that high, which of course is also how the art market is structured? You know, the 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 eventual nature of the art market is absolutely premised on the same drug, which is we um, we do lots of things in privacy and secrecy, and then we suddenly open the doors. You know, first of all to the privileged people at the opening, and then to the public. You know, this is this is why, as you you're absolutely right. The public sphere is the, the concept of the the arts institution as a kind of a, you know nominal public sphere is completely redundant because it's not. It's a striated and hierarchized letting in, letting the light shed upon. And I think that that so there's a structure also within within the way in which exhibitions are organised. It's yet another reason why we need to stop focusing on this kind of eventual exhibition momentum which replicates the drug. It replicates both the drug of crisis and the privatization of neoliberalism. So, so it, it, it doesn't allow us to, despite the fact that, of course, it's very pleasurable, <laughs> this is the problem, huh? You know, that, that actually, that, that, that this, 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 this way that um, 
the the artist's um, economic structure is trained on the kind of you know creating something in the studio. I know this is not all artists, but you know it's the majority still, and it's the standard form of privatization. You know the privatization of the intellect. Artist does something in the studio, allows a curator in to come and look at it. Curator opens it to the world. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm being really reductive, but <laughs> let me just go that 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 actually um, that that's that's a that's an eventual drug. Also, perhaps to follow up on, on Andre, I think that, that history is very difficult to read, and in a sense, there are different temporalities mm. uh, that that can be uh, unknown to us. I mean, and it is really sure that you know uh, there has been a building up of solidarities or micropolitics, uh, which then, on the long term, uh, will 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 change the balance of the uh, current historical forces and 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 the space of capital. I mean, the temporalities of capitalism are very contradictory, as we know. So there is this kind of you know collapse of of, of stasis and, and and eternal change. But at some point, uh, the forces of uh, resistance that that normally would reproduce capitalism at some point will tap into another direction. So I think it's very difficult to read history linearly. And um, and so that might be one of the things, not to be discouraged by the past. I mean, after all, economists never, you know, they've been, they've been writing a lot about economic crisis since the 50s or 60s, and nobody managed to prevent them. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think you just want to go to soak some sun outside on the terrace. Yes. But there is a question disappointing you. Oh, Clara, you have to like that. Oh, Hello. Um, now I was just thinking, um, you know, about what you just said that nobody has ever been able to prevent the crisis, and the reason is because all the economic models are based on the past and on a lot of assumption that sometimes you know they are just you know very big extra abstraction from the real the real life isn't it a little bit like that with art as well i mean aren't we looking at all this changing from a past perspective looking at what has been what you know the consequences of this and everything and everything so you know my question obviously is how are we going to you know go after that, I mean, you know, to, 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 to win the battle with a past that actually is not really teaching much to prevent, you know, negative happenings for the future or, or positive happenings. I mean, we are not able to predict anything really. So, you know, that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I really like the idea of future <laughs> vocabularies because I think it's a nice way of thinking you know how how we can how we can deal with the future by maybe kind of working together on, on on thinking the basic terms of our engagement. I mean, I like I like the idea of a vocabulary that we can start uh, putting together from scratch. Yeah, I think if we, if we want to reclaim management or reclaim the economy. It's just I think that the the economic models, of course, that are uh, the dominant ones now are not based on the past. They're based on on prediction of the future. So th that is what financialization is. But it's not done by the human mind. That's important to remember. It's only algorithms, right? So we, we what would be a, what would be our alternative to algorithms if we're talking about we can reclaim management, we can reclaim cultural institutions, we can reclaim the economy. How can we reclaim that kind of speculation of of, of financialization? I think that's that's. That's that's what we have to think about. No? We have to invent our own algorithms. Well, I don't. I mean, I I have one small solution to that, which is that, whilst you're right that the algorithm does the financial modelling that speculation is based on, the the financial al algorithm is still, to a certain extent, based on um, data. So what we need to do is um, uh, ourselves, and again, this is one of those, this is again where I would use the word humble or mundane, we need to spend a lot of time getting hold of that data. And then we need to um, pump that data, which might be different, or we might, the, the, the algorithm might be different, okay? So for instance, 
one of the things that is really important to do is get hold of art market data, real data, not just the stuff from the secondary market and not just the stuff that's, you know, um, uh, that one it can see on those various kind of websites, um, like art facts, and say, okay, well, this, this is really how the mar this is really how the art market works. This is the data. And if we, if we use the same algorithm but put different data into it, then we fa financially speculate on the future in different ways. That's the way it works. Okay? <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's simple. <laughs> yeah. I have a microphone, but you don't charge. So if you want to close this session, <laughs> so I'm on the yeah, I think we can have a coffee break unless there's someone else that has a burning <laughs> issue they want to raise. I think we'll continue the conversation in a more, let's say, practical but also geopolitical sense in the next conversation. So.